Manager at Lucid and the lead PM for Lucid Chart. But because this is a design and product conference, you were probably expecting my headshot to look a little bit more like this. In all seriousness, I have been uh, in the Utah tech scene for over seven years. I was even a math teacher for a hot minute, and I've been at Lucid for almost five. For those who don't know, Lucid is the only visual collaboration suite that helps users see and build the future from idea to reality. We have two products, Lucid Chart and Lucid Spark. Lucid Chart is focused on uh, intelligent diagramming. And Lucid Spark, which is relatively new, is a virtual whiteboard. But you guys aren't here for an advertisement about Lucid. You're here to watch me fail. I mean, to hear about how I failed. You're here because I royally messed up one time, and I tried to learn from it, and now I'm going to try to teach you about it. So let's go back to a long, long time ago, back when the world and the internet were a very, very different place. 2018. I was also very different. I was earlier in my career, a much younger product manager. Oh, no, not this picture again. This one. Anyway, Lucid 2 was very different. Lucid was a fast-growing startup with less than 300 employees. Now there's about 800. Um, and I was assigned the flagship product, Lucid Chart. So um, Lucid Chart wanted to be the number one diagramming solution out there worldwide. And we focused on two ways of getting to that goal. The first one is we identified automated diagramming capabilities that could help us compete against our competitors. And then the second one was we wanted to optimize for core diagramming use cases that would help the average user. So in this vein, we released this beautiful new org charting experience. And it was a huge success. We vastly increased the, feature, the usage of the feature. And because it had that automated, auto, excuse me, and because it had that automated diagramming capability, it demoed really, really well, and our sales team were able to sell it like hotcakes, and we made a ton of money. So Lucid came to me and they said, "Hey, Laura, we want you to repeat this success with a different diagramming use case." And I was like, "Heck yeah!" At that time, I was paired with Sanjana, a UX designer. She was my partner in crime. And like me, she was bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, relatively new to her career. And we were pumped. And we jumped into this project head first and without abandon. So we thought, mind maps. That seemed like a good candidate. Relatively similar in technical execution to org charts with their tree-like structure, but with unique user intents to make them very interesting and a good opportunity. We could also leverage the auto layout capabilities that had demoed so well in org charts. Also, Lucid already had a ton of these mind mapping customers, but they weren't super satisfied with our offerings. Typically, these users would find Lucid Chart on Google, and they would hit a landing page, and they would sign up, maybe kick the tires a bit, but Ultimately, they would churn. They did not like the existing experience. So what did we do? Like all good product and UX duos, we started with the users. We did some open-ended discovery, use case deep dives, prototype testing, the works. We knew these users and their problems backwards and forwards. That wasn't all, though. We did some awesome competitor research, and we went beyond mind maps. Yes, we looked at mind maps, but we also looked at brainstorming tools, at note-taking apps. We went very, very broad. And we knew the landscape and its hits and misses, and we knew we could do better. We were so confident. Our solutions had prototyped well, and our engineers were like, heck yes, we think we can release significant value in reasonable time. Also, our bosses were convinced. We had taken them along through the whole journey. We showed them the user pain. We created journey maps and other artifacts that we shared throughout the company. So 
we knew everything, right? We knew these customers, we knew their problems, our bosses were on board, our engineers were on board. What happened? What went wrong? Any ideas? We couldn't sell the darn thing. Let me explain. Historically, Lucidchart wanted to be diagramming for every person and every single use case. And that helped us grow really, really fast initially. But as we became a larger company and a larger product, it was time for us to focus on our core users and to figure out who the product could best serve and also who we could sell and market to most optimally. This was top of mind for our leadership team, but it hadn't yet trickled down to the rest of the company, and Sanjana and I were not yet made aware. Big changes were coming, but we just didn't know about it. So it had gotten to about the end of our discovery period, and Sanjana and I went to go wrap up some loose ends with the pricing and packaging team. And we sat down with the head of growth and demand gen at the time, and he was like, why are you looking at these mind mapping customers? He was very confused. It turns out mind mapping users did not fit the new strategic direction for Lucidchart. Lucidchart was going to be a new intelligent diagramming space. It was going to help users clarify complexity, align their insights, and build the future faster with that intelligence. Mind mappers didn't want that. They wanted a lightweight space to brainstorm. So if we built the feature, yeah, these users would come, but they wouldn't pay. And that put the kibosh on the project. Our engineers never even started. And I was crushed. The project had failed, so obviously I failed. I was a failure. I had messed up at work before, but nothing like this. This was big. And I didn't know what to do. So I sat down and took some time and some ice cream, and I tried to figure out, well, what can at least can I learn from this situation? Here are the two questions that I asked myself. The first is, did the project actually fail? And the second is, did I fail? So for the first, I'll save you some time. The answer is no, the project didn't fail. But let's step back and ask ourselves, what would make a project like this a failure? Typically in product development, we're so used to building and releasing things and we equate that with success that you think that, oh hell, she didn't release anything, she must have failed. But it doesn't always work that way. In my opinion, it's only a failure if you fail to learn anything from it. And oh boy, we learned a lot, specifically around checking our assumptions and our biases. So as I mentioned, I was relatively early in my product career, and I was thoroughly on top of Mount Stupid right here. For those who don't know, this is a graph of the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's a cognitive bias where people with little experience or ability overestimate their own awesomeness. That means that your inexperience causes you to make mistakes, but it also causes you to fail to realize that those mistakes really are mistakes. In my situation, I had made three massive assumptions that were completely wrong, and I didn't realize how wrong they were until that meeting with the head of growth. So, what were my assumptions? Well, I assumed we totally had the right stakeholders and we were totally involving them at all the right ways and all the right times. And, oh yeah, we knew Lucid's target market and target markets and strategy, that never changes. It's the same all the time. And the third is whatever, man, we did the discovery work. Everyone knows delivery comes after discovery. So let's start with the first one, stakeholders. These are way more than just people you need to cajole into doing something for you or agreeing with you, or people you need to warn if you're gonna go off and release something drastic. These are your allies. They are excellent sources of information. They're your sounding boards, and honestly, sometimes they're your protectors. In fact, 
Uh, well, early career PMs, they tend to think they can build things in isolation, like they've done their research, they've got good solutions, they may be validated. So yeah, that's that, done, check that box, ready to go. But that's not how product development works. Product decisions always have massive, widespread downstream effects. And it's just common decency for you to give your coworker a say in the things that might, uh, might impact them. Additionally, companies, users, products, markets, they're all insanely complex. And one UX and PM duo, even if they're super awesome like we were, they couldn't possibly know everything. So that's why your stakeholders are so important. And you can't say that you've done all of your research unless that research also involves learning from your stakeholders. So, all right. Uh, in my situation, I had overlooked growth and anyone involved in pricing and packaging and was just plowing right ahead. Had I met with them earlier on in the process, I probably would have found out about this strategy change earlier and maybe pivoted earlier, saving everyone a lot of time and me a lot of heartache. But that didn't happen. So now, I try to take stock of my stakeholders, and I try to do it before discovery work even begins. There are tons of ways of doing this, reforges, splash zone, Colin Eden's matrix, whatever. It doesn't matter what you use. What matters is that you are taking the time to understand who influences your work and also who is influenced by your work. So, obviously we didn't have all the right stakeholders, but that's okay. We knew Lucid's target market. We knew Lucid's strategy. Lucid had always been, Lucid had always been diagramming for everyone in every use case, and that doesn't change. Strategies don't change. Man, if I had even stopped to think about this for a second, I would have realized how insanely naive that is. Markets change. What people want and need change. And if they didn't, then people would still want non-collaborative desktop dinosaurs for diagramming. Good companies know this, and great companies adapt to get ahead of this change in the changing markets. Often, Product teams are at the forefront of this change. Uh, sometimes you can have startups that change really fast and really often, and newer PMs might not have the experience to anticipate or appreciate this change, but it's not just them. It's also tenured PMs. Tenured PMs can get complacent. We know the product, we know the market, we know the customers, so we're, we're used to just going along with the flow. We assume the status quo. Uh, it's easy to say, oh, well, it sold well in the past, so it'll continue to sell well in the future. Or, oh, this feature met that strategy need then, it'll continue to meet it now. This is one of those areas where those stakeholders I mentioned earlier can come in handy. But it can be more difficult than just bringing them along with your vision. What you want to, well, let me back up. Sorry, a little nervous, no, micro failure right here. Um, it can be a little bit more complicated than bringing them along with your vision. In my situation, uh, my stakeholders knew, at least some of them knew, that this strategy change was coming, but they didn't know if they were allowed to tell me or if I knew or if this was public knowledge yet, so they kept their mouths shut. What do you do in situations like that? Well, you need to help your stakeholders help you. And to do that, you set out all of your context and all of your assumptions. Lay out everything on the table for them. And step back. Ask them, hey, what am I missing? Where am I going wrong? You're not asking them to tell you all the answers. And you're not asking them to fill in all the missing holes or do the research for you. But what you are doing is giving them the opportunity to gently course correct you without forcing their hand and making them disclose information they might not be allowed to do so at that time. In fact, it only takes one person going, hmm, I think you might need to reconsider that right there. That could change an entire course of a project. Okay, so we didn't have the right stakeholders. 
our target market was changing, or our target strategy was changing. But whatever, that doesn't matter. We did the discovery work. Delivery comes after discovery. It looks like this. It doesn't look like this. Yeah, there are two problems with this thinking. The first is that not every good idea needs to be shipped. There's value in not cluttering your product. And the second is that timing is very important, and some good ideas become great with just a little bit of time. I mentioned earlier one way in which a good idea isn't ready to be shipped, and that's we couldn't sell it. But that's not the only one. You could have poor product market fit. You could have overly high development cost, maybe a misalignment with strategy, little option A, little option B. So many opportunities here. Unfortunately, if you've spent time and effort getting your team and your stakeholders and your friends and your mother and everyone else on board with this project, it can be really, really difficult to let go. When that happens, reframe the situation. Take the negatives and flip them into the positives. So for me, I didn't lose a feature. We simplified the product to help our core audiences and our core personas. And I didn't fail to deliver new customer value. I learned what our customers needed and why Lucidchart might not be the best tool for that. And I didn't waste time on something we never even released. I de-risked before development, and then I shared my learnings with the company. And this isn't just lip service. These are honest, real, true benefits to Lucid and to Lucid's customers. Focusing on intelligent diagramming needs of teams that build and implement software has been a massively successful strategy change for Lucidchart. And so has separating that intelligent, or excuse me, that uh, lightweight brainstorming use case. I mentioned earlier that timing isn't always right and that some good ideas become even better with just a little bit of extra time. Well, in October 2020, Lucid released a brand new product, Lucid Spark. Lucid Spark is a cloud-based virtual whiteboard where teams can get together creatively and work in real time. It is way better at meeting that lightweight diagramming use case, or well, lightweight brainstorming use case. And it's been insanely successful. It has vastly exceeded our expectations. And the work that Sanjana and I did played a big, big part in that. We helped Lucid better understand that type of customers, their needs, their pains. It's been three years, and we're still asked about our research. We left an impression. And not only that, but we were able to leverage what we learned to create a bigger ongoing impact a much, much larger impact than just one mind mapping feature ever could have. So to recap so far, I made some big assumptions that caused the project to fail. The first is we didn't have all the right stakeholders when I thought we did. The second is that we knew our target market and that wasn't going to change, and it did. And the third was that delivery naturally comes after discovery, and that's just silly. But despite all of that, the project wasn't a failure. Lucid was very satisfied with our work. Our managers were happy. And because we were able to leverage our learning and create an outsized impact, like our time wasn't a waste. People were happy. So why did I feel so bad? Why did I feel still like I had failed? Well, did I fail? This one took a little bit more time and even more therapeutic ice cream. But again, the answer is no. I learned a ton. And enough to knock me off of Mount Stupid right there and get me on track to furthering my career. I was getting better at checking my biases, at communicating early and often, at monitoring my assumptions, and so much more. This failure 
made me a better product manager. Now, this isn't one of those cliche talks about, oh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, or, you know, fail fast and fail often. We already heard Daniel's thoughts on that. It's a talk on stop beating yourself up. And it's hard. Oh, sorry, I cut out. That's hard. It takes a mind shift, but it's one we're subconsciously doing all of the time in other aspects of our lives. So for example, let me tell you about Katie. Katie is a good friend of mine and a fellow product manager at Lucid. She is an outdoor fiend. She does like stand-up paddleboard yoga. She does hiking insane distances. She is just, in general, a very Utahn. And one day she decided, I'm going to go on a 10-day backpacking trip. And she had never done that before. She had gone on backpacking trips, but usually only for about one day. So like any sane person about to do an insane task, she wanted to practice beforehand. Now, one of the things that worried her was food. That food needed to be non-refrigerated, light enough for her to carry in her backpack for 10 days, filling enough for, to get over that calorie deficit from hiking, and also it needed to squash cravings because she was going to be eating the same food for 10 days. And there is nothing worse than thinking about bacon, eggs, chicken fried steak, and being miles and days away from the nearest Greasy Spoon diner. So what did she do? She tried a couple out. Every weekend, she would go on a short hiking or backpacking trip, eat a meal, see how it fared. And early, it wasn't very good. <laughs> she was a little concerned and thought, man, if I can't even do one day, how am I possibly going to do 10? But she persisted, and she kept trying. And she ultimately got into a pattern that she felt comfortable with. And I'm happy to say her trip was a massive success. She had a ball, and she, her food was fine, not even a worry. Katie did what product managers and UX designers do in their jobs all the time. She de-risked. She de-risked by uh, taking a gnarly problem, breaking it down into the things that was bugging her, even prototyping with short hikes. She de-risked, and that led her to be a success. Yeah, there were bumps in the road, but not all of these bumps felt like failures. And I get it. This analogy isn't perfect, because her risks were relatively small. But the point is still valid. We are always de-risking through failure in our lives. So if that kind of small failure is so ubiquitous, why does it sometimes feel so bad when we fail at work? Well, if you're like me, it's usually because of two things. The first is that you are defining success in unreasonable terms. And the second is that you are spinning into a spiral of shame and self-doubt. Now, the first is the easy one. The first is a mind shift thing. Amount of effort does not equal amount of success. And amount of output does not equal amount of success. Or, as Sanjana, my partner in failure, says, Companies look at success by what their employees produce, but individuals can't do that. If I do that, I'm going to go crazy. And honestly, if people are judged only by what they produce, then this is the only evaluation we'd ever get. But in seriousness, product development teams are focused on OKRs, KPIs, any other three-letter metric you can think of. There's always a clear target and a clear definition of what is success and what is failure. Your career doesn't have that luxury. There's rarely a strong end goal. And being successful isn't very tangible like that. That means it can be difficult to see how these tiny little failures all lead up to you being a better product manager or a better UX designer. But Career growth, personal development, these things are nonlinear, just like design, just like product development. So you need to stand back and give yourself room to iterate and learn. Give yourself a little grace. Now here's where you're going, yeah, 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 Laura, whatever. That is way easier said than done. And you know what? You're completely right. When my project failed, I had a million bad thoughts running through my head. I have 
really failed. I messed up. My t what is my team going to think? What are my coworkers going to think? Everyone is going to think I'm awful. I'm going to lose my job. My partner is going to leave me. I'm going to run out of money. I'm going to die. Like, it was awful. And I'm sure we've all felt like this before. But companies, they tell their employees that you need to learn from failure, but they don't always tell you about this part of it. They don't always address this. So here's what I do that I have found works for me. The first is respect your own feelings. Take some time to indulge in that disappointment, that shame, that fear. Take just a little bit of time and then let it go. It's not easy and it's not foolproof. There will be a time uh, a month from now or a year from now when you're lying in bed looking at the ceiling and all you can think about is how many ways that you've failed. But the only thing that you can do then is try to let it go. One thing that helps me when doing that is reflecting. What went well? What didn't go well? What did I learn? This introspection helps me solidify those learnings and remember them. Otherwise, I just keep failing in the same way over and over and over again. Also, it kickstarts this mind shift process that I mentioned earlier. I'm not infallible, but I am learning. I am growing, and I am trying. And ultimately, this didn't negatively impact my career. As I was able to leverage our research, I later got promoted shortly after. Finally, the third thing is share what you learned with others, perhaps at a conference. But when I'm already beating myself up, there is nothing worse than well, or excuse me, there's nothing worse than misplaced pity from well-meaning coworkers. Even the most honest and heartfelt condolences sound like, oh, bless your heart, even when they're not. When that happens, own it. Own it, own your failure, let people know what happened, and let people know what you learned. Yeah, I really enjoyed the Mind Map project, but because I didn't fully appreciate the changes to Lucid's strategy, it wasn't a good fit. But man, I learned so much. The cool thing about this is, yeah, this vulnerability is hard, but it opens doors. It reminds you and your coworkers that you're learning that you're improving. Also, maybe it helps a coworker of yours get over their own feelings of failure, or maybe it helps them avoid a similar mistake in their own career. It's an excellent sign of a good upcoming leader when they're not only owning their mistakes, but they're making sure that others are learning from them as well. So, if this is my step three, if this is my own personal way of sharing my learnings with you to get over those demons of self-doubt, what do I want you to learn? First, use your stakeholders. Consult those who might be affected by what you're building or even those who are just plain interested. Make use of their expertise and advice. Second, watch your assumptions. Things change. They're always going to change. That's part of product development. When that happens, lay out your assumptions. Let others help you. Help your stakeholders help you. And the third thing is stop beating yourself up. We are all learning, and our failures and their lessons are just a part of this process. So, thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, Joey would like to know, how can you keep your stakeholders focused on the problem, feature, opportunity to keep it in scope? Ooh, that's a really good question. And uh, um, there's typically two things that I do. One is be very annoying. I go and I talk to my stakeholders about this all the time to make sure that it's fresh in their minds and that they're understanding what we're doing and why. And then the second one is a little less annoying. Um, and that one is ground those stakeholders to the user value you're providing. 
in my opinion, that tends to help them realize, oh, okay, thing A is extra important, and thing B is just what I want. If that doesn't work, then hit them with data. Hit them with other uh, experience. Try your hardest. <laughs> Sometimes stakeholders are just stubborn. That's great. <laughs> it's true. They're always stubborn, those <laughs> stakeholders. Um, can you share any insights you might have to help organizations with letting go of things that were good ideas when they were released, but later on are no longer good? <laughs> yeah. Um, it happens more often than we want to admit because of that change. Um, it's best not to frame it as you're losing something or you're killing a feature. It's best to frame it in the positives that you're gaining from it, right? So in our situation, let's say we had built the mind mapping feature and it wouldn't have sold. Then removing it lets us reduce tech debt while still like simplifying the product and making the product itself easier. It's, it's all about switching from negatives to positives and people rally behind that more. Okay. Um, James asks, uh, your experience as a PM who wasn't briefed on the company's strategy Le leading to your failure resonates with me being in an executive role. How do, you, how do leaders who are contributing to strategy creation and read in on current strategy ensure that the PMs are briefed in a way that they aren't set up to have an experience like you had? Um, has Lucid implemented any best practices in that regard that have worked well? That's a really good question. That's difficult, and it's, I'm not gonna lie, I can't speak to the executive use case, I am not an executive, um, but it happens with our team sometimes. Uh, like, if I'm working on a discovery project that's really, really early on, I don't want to get my scrum teams a little bit worried that there's going to be a big pivot in what they do. So what I try to do is I meet individually with my team members and get to know what they like. Some people need to be warned. I'm that kind of person. I need to be warned. Even the tiniest little hint is good enough for me. Other people, don't bother them because it means they will panic. So if, if I were an executive, what I would do is I would try to meet with the people under me um, or even the people under them and understand their preferences. This admittedly is very, very difficult because if it's something big like massive strategy change, then you tell one person and you may as well have told everyone. Um, so I'm not going to say I have the solution, but just try to be mindful of the people you work with and what stresses them out. That's great. Um, one last question. Uh, in retrospective, is there one thing that you would have done differently within this case study experience that you've shared with us today? Oh, yeah. Um, I think the big, 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 big one would be to involve that pricing and packaging and growth team earlier. Um, I think we would have found out about that strategy shift much, much earlier rather than later. And that would have really moved us in a different direction. So again, it's even if they hadn't been able to just spell it out exactly for me, hey, we're changing our strategy and your idea is no longer good, um, they might have been able to move me in a better direction. So I try to get a very broad understanding of stakeholders, what information they might have, what interests they have in the project. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they're excellent sources of information and gossip, it's great. Okay, well thank you. Let's give uh, Laura another round of applause.